So thank you for joining us. I'm going to be a little bit early, um, but I would like to wish our students, our staff, our administrators, our community members a very happy Thanksgiving. Yesterday was Halloween, so it seems really early to be saying that, but we won't be together until after Thanksgiving. So I hope each of you will have an opportunity to spend time with people who are important to you. I'd like to formally congratulate Dr. Lenart and Dr. Montgomery, as well as the Lake Forest High School, you look very surprised, Don't worry. as well as the Lake Forest High School students, staff, and administrators for achieving the rating of exemplary on the most recent Illinois State Report card. This is the highest rating possible and represents an increase from last year that we deserve to be very proud of. This exemplary rating follows our 2021 award as a National Blue Ribbon High School. And while we celebrate these achievements, we cannot ignore the evidence of learning loss shown in math and reading test score trends across Illinois and the nation. Ensuring academic excellence is our mission and our goal, and we will continue to work to support our students and our teachers so that achievement of success in, is attainable for all our learners. You will hear more from, on this from Dr. Lenart and Dr. Montgomery. We have several important meetings coming up this month as we focus on continuing to improve our educational experience and our academic facilities. Thursday, District 115 will host our second strategic planning committee meeting. We will build on the information gathered during our first session and look forward to exploring the major objectives identified by the data that was gathered from input by students, teachers, administrators, board members, parents, and guardians when the committee met on October 6th. We have a third meeting scheduled to take place on January 10th and potentially one in late February, early March, depending on how much work we make at our um, November and January meetings. And then we will circle back with our community and share publicly the details of our newly developed strategic plan. It is our intention to use this plan, which will connect with our mission and vision and portrait of a learner to guide us and govern us in the coming years. Our Facilities Master Planning Committee will host a community forum on Monday, November 14th at 6 p.m. That will take place at the Lake Forest High School East Campus, and there will be building tours at 7 p.m. following that uh, forum. We look forward to sharing the latest plans for improving our facilities with all members of our Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, and Knollwood community. This evening we'll provide the most recent information regarding a possible referendum in the April election. In the coming months, there will be ongoing opportunities to learn more about this critical work as we strive to ensure that all Lake Forest High School stakeholders will be fully informed of the needs being addressed and the importance of your support. Finally, Tuesday, November 15th is National School Board Member Day. And since we will not be together on that day, I wanted to take a moment this evening to publicly express my gratitude and appreciation for the time, compassion, and dedication my fellow board members bring to their role as school board members. This is a volunteer role that is equal parts rewarding and demanding. We are elected to represent the best interests of our community while providing the best educational opportunities and outcomes for our students. It can, at times, be a daunting task to make decisions that impact what we are able to deliver to our students while ensuring we are acting as the best stewards of our taxpayer dollars. Having been an active member in the Lake Forest Public Schools for many years, I have had the chance to see our district evolve and change. As a community member and a Board of Education member, I feel blessed to share this tremendous responsibility with the six individuals seated on either side of me. Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, and Knollwood are fortunate to have each of you volunteering your time to ensure the best interests of our community are superbly represented. So with that, I would like to say thank you to Sally Davis, John Noble, Dewey Weinbrenner, Dave Burns, Marcus Schabacher, and John Benson. And I would re be remiss if I didn't also thank Tiana Adams, who is the glue that holds this board together. So thank you to all of you um, as we celebrate National School Board Member Day on November 15th. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Montgomery for the superintendent's report. Thanks so much, Jenny.
Okay, on tonight's report, I am going to hit four different topics, and I'm just going to give you a quick uh, table of context or over, overview. Uh, I'll start with the facilities planning, hit strategic planning, uh, then also talk a little bit about some questions we've been receiving about residency and also highlight our One Lake Forest statement and then finish with gratitude and an update on the great work that was done with the Grateful Market that happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, so I'll start with facilities and I'll build off of what Jenny said which was we have a great deal of education on the horizon around a potential referendum that um, could occur as early as April of 23, although the could occur is getting likely to occur um, as we get further into this discussion. So we will have a facilities master plan oversight committee meeting. Any member who was a part of that will be invited for an online forum for an update on the progress that the board has made uh, this Friday morning in an online environment. Then November 14th, we will have the community forum. You will receive postcards in the mail, uh, I think the week of November 7th, so next week. And then we will have the opportunity to gather feedback after that forum ahead of a potential board vote on a resolution around the referendum at our December 6th regular meeting. So here is the postcard or something similar to what the postcard will look like in the mailboxes and it announces the forum uh, which will be from 6 to 7. Building tours will occur immediately following and we are sending this to every uh, household in the, in the uh, Lake Forest. Uh, Lake Bluff and Knollwood communities to invite them in. Uh, we have been, uh, we're, we're going to continue to extend our reach uh, to try to share the information out because I think uh, just by happenstance and by connection, our parents are more informed than our community. So we are trying uh, to invite them in to educate them ahead of a board vote so we can get any feedback uh, and process it accordingly. The um, Referendum is one, I, I want to say small piece, but a piece to a much bigger puzzle of what work is being done in the district. And the plan that is governing that is the strategic plan which is being developed currently. So there are over 50 people coming together that are building on the work from the portrait of a learner which was completed this spring. Uh, and developing a strategic plan that is directly aligned to that portrait which is important to me and uh, the leadership team, that there's alignment to the vision and then how we actualize that into actual work. At the October 6th meeting, and there's one this week, so there's one on November 3rd, um, we asked the 50 people in the room to do a SWOT analysis or what is going really well, what are our strengths, what are our weaknesses, what are our opportunities and what are our threats. This Thursday, we will share out the results from the individual responses and trends that emerge from those individual responses. I have uh, seen a preview with the team and I think that the committee will be pleased with the trends that are emerging because they're directly in line with the topics or high topic needs that I have been hearing about through conversations uh, from the onset of my tenure here as the superintendent and um, throughout last year and this year. The following meeting will occur on January, January 10th with the intent that the board will be asked to approve the next five-year strategic plan at the February scheduled meeting. There is no regularly scheduled um, January meeting and that's why we are waiting for February to bring that before the board. Uh, some of the board members are a part of that uh, process. They were also a part of the portrait work and I want to thank their support of um, this process because it's some, in some ways it's, it's getting less and less glamorous when it turns into actual work. Uh, but organizations, whether they're private or public, um, that are the highest performing in my opinion, have a well-established vision and mission as well as a strategic plan that is governing all of the work that's being done in the short term and the long term. Here is the agenda for this uh, week's meeting and we are uh, having 67 in the morning and 115 in the afternoon we switch them back and forth uh, as each meeting to kind of allow for people's work schedules to vary and people aren't missing the same amount of or the same time of work um, throughout this process uh, you will see that the stakeholder or perceptions will be discussed in length around 
what are the trends, how does the board or how does a small group and whole group view those trends, do they agree, do they not agree, and then the hope is by the end of this meeting we will have priority areas created for the writing team then to go to work from the November meeting to January work to de or January meeting to develop actual goals and objectives around the priority areas that the stakeholders or design team members have uh, brought to our attention. Do you have any questions? I'm going to take a breath just for my own benefit. Do you have any questions around strategic planning or what's on the horizon with that work um, this week or beyond? Very good. Thank you again for participating. I want to take a moment and talk about questions I've heard about residency and then also uh, that'll dovetail into just some general themes of topics that I'm hearing uh, to make sure that I am um, sharing with, um, uh, I kind of give you an update of what I'm hearing and how I'm feeling about what I'm hearing. Uh, so let's start with residency. There has been some questions around uh, how we determine residency within a district or within this district, that matter. And I want to uh, share with you that this information can all be found on our website, but all students that register for uh, 115 are required to pr have proof of residency. So they have to uh, provide three documents, not one, not two, but three, that verify residency to complete the enrollment process. I can attest personally as a parent of four children uh, that there are no exceptions made. Uh, whether you were the superintendent or not, uh, you all go through this process uh, to ensure that you are residents of either 67 or 115. We also added in recent years a third party provider to verify um, any publicly available documents and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hermes to just talk about that third party provider that goes above and beyond our internal measures. Sure, as long as you don't don't press me on the exact date or how many years it's been, but it's been several years we've been using a system called the CLEAR system. This is through Thomson Reuters. Um, it's used also by other municipalities and law enforcement and lots of different um, applications, but basically with the assistance of Jordan and the tech team, we actually take the electronic information provided during uh, InfoSnap, so when you're registering your student online, and then we, we batch it, we upload it through the CLEAR system, and it's basically searching billions of data points that are all um, publicly available information. So they're looking for utility bills, credit card bills, driver's license, anything, a vehicle you may have registered to that address. And each um, registration has to meet a minimum criteria so they can tell you with a certain amount of accuracy whether or not that they believe that person is in fact a resident. If it doesn't meet the minimum threshold, it kicks out, and then an actual human body would take a look at that. They may reach out and ask for additional pieces of information. They may do additional investigation. They may work with the SRO officer. It just depends. But that is something that is done in every single registra registration in both districts. I would uh, add only that if the residency is confirmed at the start of the school year, and if a family moves or changes uh, their place of residency outside of the district, the, by Illinois law, they are allowed to stay in the district for the duration of the school year. So even if they are moving in September, for example, they are allowed access to our district uh, for the duration of this school year in which the verification of their residency was determined at the onset. That is the only exception, uh, and that is governed by state law and requirements. Uh, so in full transparency, I want to share that, um, that caveat or that except, exception to the rule. Absent that scenario, anyone that is walking the halls of 67 or 115 um, have went through this process and they are residents of the district. So I'm going to marry this with the One Lake Forest statement because I have been hearing some under- one Lake Forest High School, forgive me, D Dr. Lenar is correcting me, I can hear her whispering. Um, she often keeps me in line. Um, so I'm gonna marry this statement with that previous slide because there has been conversations around um, who is attending the school, um, what's happening with fights, what's happening with um, different discipline that's being administered. Uh, and I don't think it's any surprise that the last six weeks have been trying 
from a leadership standpoint and a community standpoint. Um, and because of that, I want to highlight this work. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that it is exceptionally refreshing, if I take a positive viewpoint, that we are not talking about the pandemic and that we are back into normal cycles of things are going really well and things are going really poorly and you have those crest and troughs. Uh, that is something that I have missed. Um, I love the crests a little bit more than the troughs, selfishly. Uh, that being said, this is life and we're experiencing life and teenagers are being teenagers uh, and that is refreshing uh, that there are those things that are occurring in real life and we are talking about something other than epidemiology. This statement is important to highlight because last year this board came together as a byproduct of over two years of work to create a one Lake Forest High School statement. And I'm gonna highlight some of the words. I'm gonna try not to read the whole thing, although I entertain the idea of reading the whole thing. Um, but I'm just gonna highlight some of the language that goes with this statement. Uh, D115 espouses the importance of fostering an inclusive environment for all students and staff. An inclusive environment encourages the affirmation, appreciation, and exploration of multiple identities and multiple perspectives. We understand that excellent and exemplary school districts foster a culture of inclusion where the lives and needs of all children are, or all students are validated, recognized, and appreciated. And then it goes on to say that in order to maximize the possibility for each student's growth, we continue to actively work to elim eliminate barriers systems and practices that maintain or contribute to disparities, inequities, discrimination, and intolerance of any kind. And finishes with, our district is better for all students and staff when we embrace and value diversity that exists, and it is our responsibility to expose students to diverse learning experiences and perspectives, and to assist students in, make, in thinking about themselves and the world around them. We want all of our students to be prepared to successfully engage the larger global community and have the courage to make a difference. This statement is exceptionally important to me. It's important to this board. The board has taken, at the last board meeting, there was an action item around board goals. And this statement, in addition to the portrait of a learner, were intertwined in almost every goal that the board created. And this statement will come to life in the strategic planning process, but I have witnessed isolated incidences over the last six weeks that are independent of each other, but are being used or could be being used in a narrative that I'm not comfortable with and I believe is in direct opposition of this uh, approach that the district is trying to take. And that's why I'm highlighting it tonight. Any questions about the One Lake Forest High School statement? Thank you. If I may add a comment from my perspective, and I think I speak for the board, I hope I speak for the board. And I, and I truly appreciate that you clarified this position about you know some of the divisiveness we have seen um, in the school over the past few weeks in particular. I am going a step further than you did and would state um, unambiguously that I believe that hate does not have a place in our community or in the school. This board, as you mentioned uh, several times, unanimously approved the One Lake Forest Statement and I as a board member and a citizen certainly fully committed to free speech and the right to express one's beliefs, whatever those beliefs are. However, when and where this right is abused to demean, threaten, and marginalize others who have different opinions because of their beliefs, their race, their ethnicity, their personal preferences, their sexual orientation, their gender, or whatever reason, it is our responsibility as board and administrators um, to put a stop to that abuse. And we cannot do that in silence or behind closed doors. And therefore, I want to restate, hate expressed through speech, through action, and in thoughts has no place at Lake Forest High School. You, the students, the teachers, the staff, and the members of this community have my commitment, and I hope I can speak for my colleagues, 
that we will not tolerate any form of that hate and we will protect those who are exposed to it. Thank you. Marcus, well said. I'm not going to restate what you said, but I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you for uh, bringing that point. Okay, thank you, team. The next topic is a little lighter, and it, uh, we transition into gratitude. Uh, and last week, we celebrated uh, Principal Appreciation Day. Uh, so, I, yes, I'm putting a picture up there. It's a <laughs> lovely picture, and it's my opportunity to highlight and embarrass you. Uh, but I want to take the moment, I want to take a, the opportunity in the moment to recognize uh, both Dr. Lennart and Dr. Sasson for their leadership of LFHS. And we have seen real time through multiple occurrences that leadership shine through over the last six weeks and i couldn't be happier to have them on our team and i just want to thank them profusely for their leadership in other in other topics to celebrate uh, the work of the grateful market was unparalleled in my opinion and our partner with quest made a, a great deal of this possible i want to uh, highlight a short video. It's one minute and 20 seconds, maybe. Uh, so it, it almost is short enough for my attention span. Uh, but I want to share it with you because it highlights some of the wonderful work that was done on that day. Thank you for indulging me and watching that with me. There is a lot to celebrate in the work that was done uh, on that day and for communities uh, that are at times less fortunate than ours and giving back is such a, an amazing tenet of what I believe that we should be doing for our communities. Uh, that concludes uh, my superintendent's report and thank you for your kind attention during it. <coughs> thank you, Matt. We will now move on to Aaron and with the Lake Forest High School updates. And I want to personally welcome Dr. Rachel Abel, which I know you plan to do, Aaron, but I'm going to do it too. Um, Dr. Abel is joining us on the topic of English as a Second Language, or ESL, and Bilingual Parent Advisory Committee, or B do you, call it, do you say BPAC? Um, and the Multilingual Learner Supports and Family Engagement. But first, I'm going to thank you. All right, well, um, we are falling, falling into a routine right now um, with how we actually do both the principal's report or all the principal's report, the student report, as well as our spotlight. So excited to have a third month where we are able to feature so many great scouts. Um, thank you to Pride and Laney, or I'm sorry, Laney couldn't join us, but I'm going to say something about Laney at the end because I thought she'd be here, but Pride's going to start us off with the celebrations. Pride? Hello, everyone. My vice president couldn't make it because she has the flu, but, so I'm going solo today. But she just won a state championship, so yes, maybe yes. she got the Yes, she flu. just won state for tennis. 
so that was exciting for her. Um, so starting off, sports teams are ending. Um, it was a successful football season. Um, with the la or the last home game was pink out, and uh, everyone wore pink for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which was awesome. And then also, student council put together a food drive in the ca in the commons, which was awesome. And Miss Ragna did a lot for that. And then as well as Halloween door decking decorating contest. We do this every year, so last week we had um, teams, clubs, and classes all decorate a door of their liking, and the one that won was the this class that decorated Magic School Bus, which is like a show, if you guys know, which was really cool. And then also we have our winter formal date set, which is January 21st, so we're starting to talk about that, really excited, finally going to be able to have it back. Because the first time, or the first, I only got to have my freshman year, and then we weren't able to have it last year or the year before. So I'm really excited about that. And then also, lastly, Student Council Appreciates, if you guys, any of you guys are familiar, we're going to start that back up again. And the first one we were thinking about doing um, counts or college counselors, because with all like the seniors turning in their applications right now, they're doing a lot of work for those kids so we thought that we'd start it off with them and give them a Gerhardt's smiley face cookie so I'm excited about that and that's all for my celebration well that's thank great you. thank you so is the winter formal is it the girls ask the boys still yes okay they like they used to call it turnaround I think but yeah. I think that winter formal is like make sure everyone knows that it's a formal dance to wear the formal attire so you don't have a theme yet for it no, I, we're trying to like come up with some ideas. We're leaning towards having it like a, maybe like a Candyland theme. So maybe like have different like aspects of that. That was just one idea, but yeah. I just want to, um, you know, really express support and thank to your idea of uh, appreciating the counselors because you know, I have a senior and. Boy, are we relying on uh, Mr. Panfil, so, and I'm yeah. sure all the other counselors are great too. So right. thank you so much for the hard work they're doing and taking some of the stress off the parents off. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Pride. You always sparkle when you're up there, the best of <laughs> LFHS. So we appreciate seeing you. And then, again, we thought Lainey would be here, and I just I would be remiss if I didn't say that this is Lainey O'Neill and Isabel Chong, Isabel Chong's second state championship for doubles so that's that's a big deal um, I just we look for so many gifts and so many talents from our students um, but pride you always stand and you're front and center showing off those talents so thank you thank you thank you guys all right on the horizon in review um, we had a very very successful virtual parent teacher conference we had um, 4,533 total conferences in that eight hour period, up from just over 4,000 and actually a 5% increase in the total number of students who had their parents or guardians participate. Um, while we would love to see 100% of our community, of course in the future, these conferences are very, very short. I participated as a teacher for the first time in many years and the countdown timer is for real. You have to get through all your information. Uh, we're just really thankful anytime we can partner together and have that face-to-face -face time. Um, a special shout out to the students who actually participated alongside their parents this year as well. It was really, it was great to get to have students sitting there and then hearing two adults who really support them. I'm also going to mention the One Lake Forest High School statement because this is something that um, coming in, um, in my first year, it was a project that had been started and then working with the team we were able to finish. I'm very proud of that work. Um, and as all of you know, it was approved last April by the board as a vision statement for our school. Um, the statement a couple years in the making it had gone through several different iterations before finally landing on the statement that's anchored in our belief in all students, all students, and our commitment to finding resources that support them, supporting them as a community, resources that support our staff as well as we, and I'm going to read this line again, as we maximize the possibility for each, each student's growth, we continue to actively work, actively work, to eliminate barriers, systems, and practices that maintain 
or contribute to disparities, inequities, discrimination, and intolerance of any kind. That is written in our statement, and that is something we believe. We believe it in any sort of a disciplinarian process. If ever it's put in front of us, we believe it in all that we do. As a follow-up for the board, I do think it's important, and this is perhaps something as well that Mr. Weinbrenner was going to talk about, and we actually did present to the Ed Committee this morning. Um, one of my instructional directors, who happens to be here, Dr. Abel, um, is also someone who's championing the One Lake Forest work. She presented on some of the departmental conversations that have been happening, some of the evidence that she's seen in curricular alignment, um, and then we just reaffirmed our shared commitment to realizing this statement. And we're very much looking forward to seeing one Lake Forest High School in our portrait of a learning strategic planning sessions and then coming into our action planning. This is really challenging work, but it's so worthwhile and we need to make sure that we give everyone an opportunity, every scout an opportunity for a promising future. Also, um, as many of you know, thank you for mentioning our exemplary rating. Um, we're very proud of that. It's been a couple of years since we've been able to obtain that rating. I do want to acknowledge, as you did, that there's quite a bit of work in our shared ownership and visioning around the SAT performance. I'm very aware of that, especially um, since I've learned we are interestingly and historically an ACT school. So that's actually the test that most of our community focuses on, although that's not the test used to um, give us our school report card rating. Um, and now that we're coming back to some semblance of normal, this work of looking at the SAT, looking at the um, reading and math portion, it's work that we're really excited about. Just in the last few days, working with different instructional directors, talking about new techniques that we can use, new strategies, um, just even boot camps, things that we can do in, cl in the class to remind students of things that they've always already learned. We're excited about that. Um, and we are all excited about making sure that we are painting the picture to the larger community, the larger Lake Forest High School community that we all know and love, one where excellence is just who we are. Um, and we will make sure that we have all of this information in our, in our annual assessment report that we'll be delivering in late winter. We've also begun planning for um, a revised student code of conduct. It's actually going to be called uh, the Student Rights and Responsibilities. We have some planning documents that we've prepared, and our Dean's Office Committee is actually going to um, head up that revision, um, and we're hoping to have something in the spring that we can make sure that we include in our handbook as well. And then finally, since it's November, we do have something that we call um, the Good Gobble Survey. We all love to gobble down turkey, but Good Gobble is about gobbling down all the wonderful things happening at Lake Forest High School. So I've included a link in my fan scouts. Um, hopefully you've seen those, but if there is a Lake Forest High School community member you want to shout out, please send those people celebrations our way. So with that, um, enough of me and enough from me. I'm really excited to introduce, I thought Ms. Ramirez would be here too. Is she? She will. Okay. Okay. Um, Dr. Rachel Abel, who's going to be talking about our multilingual learner supports as well as our BPAC committee. Dr. Abel, spotlight is on you. Ooh. Well, um, I'm just here spotlighting the great work of a, a great team. Um, as you know, all of this work and supports and anytime we're able to highlight the great work that's doing at Lake Forest, that's going on at Lake Forest High School, it's never the product of one person. Um, and so I have to give a lot of gratitude and I'm going to be sending a lot of good gobbles out to a lot of great people that I get to work with every single day. Um, so in terms of our multilingual learner supports and family engagement, that's what I get to spotlight to, uh, tonight. Um, those are just a few of our student groups that um, have supports throughout their day, but I definitely want to ensure that we um, also are intentional about our supports, our resources that we're using, and recognizing the unique strengths that every single one of those students that appear up there bring to the table because they are multilingual and they are multicultural, um, which in today's world is amazing and it's a talent and a strength that brings to our community every day. Um, some of the guidance that we've had in our programming and supports, but also our BPAC, we love acronyms and lots of different ones in education, so that's a new one maybe to the board, um, but a lot of that guidance is um, alongside with ISBE, and also um, there are lots of books that are created and published just for school boards, also for BPACs to make sure that we are following the guidelines of ISBE. 
Um, so if you would be interested in it, I can share some of that information with you. Um, so this is our program and support specifically for our multilingual learners. Um, we have language acquisition classes. We have three levels um, throughout the day at Lake Forest High School. We have an ELL workshop, which is for um, students who uh, maybe just need a resource period, just get some light support and a home base. Um, we also talk not just about academics, but that social emotional wellness. Um, we are also including Spanish for native speakers, um, which is uh, probably about five years in the making that we've had that course, but it provides really important bilingual support because as we know, when language acquisition happens and you have the bilingual support, um, that linguistic approach is much more favored than what was favored perhaps when I went to school, which is do one language and not the other. And that is incredibly damaging and completely erases um, a linguistic talent that a ta uh, family and a student brings to the table. Um, and we are going to transition that uh, after our course uh, communication and uh, committee talks a little bit more about aligning it with the Spanish language arts, which is a new, a newer um, alignment with the Spanish language standards that Illinois has adopted. Um, these are just a few of the incredible teammates that I get to work and serve with every day. So Shannon Ramirez, who helps support uh, everything that we're doing with our students and our families. Um, Kristen Gregory, Brittany Tengler is uh, one of our counselors who is bilingual, supporting our families. Um, Sandra Tinoco, who also teaches Spanish for native speakers and is often at our BPAC meetings and supporting our families. And our newest member is Alina de Garcia Escobar, who is a teaching assistant, and we've been so blessed to hire her. Um, she is bilingual and has also been a classroom teacher and is getting her bilingual certification. She is pushing in to provide Spanish language support um, into some of the core content areas in our building. Um, so she gets to work alongside some of our teachers. Um, this is just some quick data, because I'm sure you've looked at a lot of data lately, but this is really uplifting data to celebrate. Um, the number one stands for when I came into Lake Forest High School and I was honored to uh, be able to work in the district was the number of students that we are serving under the umbrella of multilingual learner support. So we had one student nine years ago. Um, we pushed that out a little bit further as we realized we needed a classroom. So then we had one class and we had one teacher. And now you just saw in the previous slide all of the amazing supports that we have um, throughout the hard work that all of that team has put together. Our three is actually a point three. So we talked a little bit about growth in other areas. We had point three growth in the access test. Um, access is the test that every English language learner takes in the state of Illinois, it's annual. Um, and it stands for assessing comprehension and communication in English. So they take it in reading, listening, speaking, and writing. Um, it's a pretty intense test and it's very demanding. So our students grew 0.3. The approximate growth is 0.2. So our students exceeded that in the state of Illinois. Um, and that was with what we just experienced the lack, last couple of years. So pretty amazing growth with our students. Um, and 100 is one of the most excellent, excellent data points that we can celebrate here at Lake Forest High School. That is the percentage of our students that graduate um, after receiving supports, either exiting or continuing those supports throughout their four years here. And we get them onto their next pathway, whether it is career um, or it is higher education. So um, we, we get to report that out to the state every, every year and it's something to celebrate within the work that our team has done. Lastly, uh, our BPAC, which again stands for our Bilingual Parent Advisory Council. Um, we meet four to five times per year. It is for our bilingual families and we do present information in Spanish. Um, it is also available in English. We present data, so just all of that data, growth, how students are doing, we have to present that same data to our families because they have to provide us feedback and input and in how we can make this school better for their family um, and ensure that their students are growing and learning alongside all of their peers. Um, it's incredibly um, uplifting to attend uh, and be a part of it, again, with a big team. It is about building relationships, celebrating, 
and of course building community. Um, we have our next one next Thursday, or this Thursday, excuse me, November 3rd, and we have a theme every, every time. Um, our meeting will be about uh, future career pathways. We'll have somebody from the College Bound Opportunities representing um, and being able to present to our families. Um, it's, it's wonderful, and I'm so thrilled that I get to tell all of you about it, so thank you. Um, and just quickly to note, um, our family languages that are currently supported just within our multilingual learner supports include French, Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, Ukrainian, am I forgetting one, Japanese and Polish. Um, and that is, those are just a few of the 38 languages that are spoken at our homes in this community. So I wanted to celebrate that. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, of course, to all the team that supports our students. Thank you. So, Rachel, yep. with BPAC, you said we have 38 different languages spoken in homes in our community. So, are you getting good attendance from the families um, across the spectrum of, of languages, or are we targeting primarily Spanish? The BPAC is targeted primarily Spanish language because we provide bilingual support in Spanish in the school. And so that is a requirement that we have from the state of Illinois in order to have those parent meetings. We started building it last year because we were anticipating that we were really going to need to provide a robust um, meeting support, uh, working alongside and collaborating with n a number of members of our team um, and bringing other people in so that we could make sure that we were providing the correct information to our parents. Um, other information is always included um, to parents in their home language. That is a requirement that we have to provide. Um, so that is just a small portion of our bilingual parents, but that one is specifically in Spanish. So thank you very much. I had a similar question. So are you, are you planning to extend that to to other languages like French or Russian or whatever the predominant second most spoken languages? Um, we, we absolutely will be extending a little bit more of that family outreach because that's, that's typically what, um, what we're finding is very um, successful is when we are calling home and we have somebody who can speak the home language and inviting our families in. Um, it's not just a quick email, although that's easy. Google Translate has made things a lot easier. Um, also that phone call and having that language being spoken is extremely powerful. Dr. Abel, could I do something that's totally unfair? Um, you presented a slide uh, to the Ed Committee this morning. Oh, okay. And that would be way beyond my technological capabilities, but I don't know if you could pull it up, the slide with the One Lake Forest um, centered around the work that um, is going on within the school. So I, if you have the slide, but, but maybe to speak to, um, I, when we started our work uh, in the Ed Committee on One Lake Forest, it resided in the Ed Committee and the key for that process was for it to be a living document that really embedded itself in the school. And Dr. Schaubacher's comments today were, were so thoughtful and, and speak to how we all feel. But I, I think it's important that w we recognize that One Lake Forest really is now embedded within the school community and the work, some of the work that you're doing that you spoke to this morning I think it's it's timely, and if and if you can maybe highlight a couple of the 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 a little bit of that work too, and I and I apologize for putting you on the spot here because that's a little beyond the scope, but but it really it 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 was so thoughtful this morning. So if you don't mind, please. Um, I did it through Canva, so I can't just share it. You can so plug I in to. I can plug yeah. in, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Airplay it. I'll airplay it. And this really is a tremendous graphic that came from Dr. Abel's um, brain, just around all of the fantastic work that's happening at Lake Forest High School. I don't know which one I... Um, so now I'm just filling time while I'm waiting on you to... I 
Okay. So it said I already have. So again, this is not, uh, this, now it's public, but um, it was in my head living there. Um, as we, we continue to discuss all the work that's, the great work that's being done in our district and just highlighting, um, you know, how they all fit together, because that's really important. We can't just continue to say, we're doing this, we're doing that, but how did it all connect? And really the One Lake Forest um, vision and statement and the work that we're doing is woven throughout every other aspect that we are talking about, whether it's Portrait of a Learner, our SEL committee, we're talking about our multi-tier system of support, we're talking about our school innovation um, and improvement plan. A lot of the elements that are coming out, and I don't know if we're calling them tenants or elements, but responsibility, engagement, and partnership are coming out of all of these groups, and that's exactly what's in the One Lake Forest statement. Um, so I thought that was very um, interesting that it's all aligning, and this is what made sense to me in really making sure that we're centering the One Lake Forest statement with whatever decision we're making. If we're talking about changing a system, um, then how are we doing that, and with what intention, and how are we grounding ourselves? So I think that's very important to always bring us back to that and I know Dr. Lenart will do that and in our guidance, but um, some things that I spoke about this morning, um, quickly, we're just talking about some of the department work, reviewing curriculum, um, thinking about perspectives that are shared and making sure that there are a wide variety of celebrations honoring of those perspectives and voices. Um, that, that has been done in a lot of different spaces. I know um, in English department, for example, they've re-examined everything that's in the English one and English two and thinking about very intentional um, work within their curriculum. Thank you so much. So much more eloquent than me, so thank you for presenting that. And it's a, it's a great image too, so thanks again for all your time and thoughts. Thank you. I love that it's all about partnership too, and that's who you are. That's who you are with the leadership team and with the students and with the departments you lead. That's what BPAC is about, is bringing more stakeholders into the room, inviting them to the table and the conversation, giving them a seat at the table. And that's who you are, Dr. Abel, and we appreciate you for that, so thank you. Thank you, but also celebrating our team, yes? <laughs> and, yes, and also celebrating the team, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think it's, I, I'm going to say something. Um, I think that I, I so appreciate everyone talking about One Lake Forest High School tonight because there have been times in the last six weeks that I have referred to that and I don't know that our community is fully aware of, number one, the the careful intention that went into creating the language of that statement. Um, I mean, it, it certainly wasn't done overnight. There was a lot of time and just careful, careful consideration that went in. And so when we've talked about that in the last six weeks, I, I feel like maybe there's been a little bit of a lack of, of complete understanding of 
that statement and how important it is and how it really is brought into the building and into the experiences our students are having each day and, and the expectation of what we believe should be available to them every day. And so I think, you know, Dr. Schaubacher's comments earlier about hate having no place in our school community, I, I think when we've referred to One Lake Forest, our community hasn't always fully understood the, the message behind that as an explanation from the school's leadership. And so I feel like tonight has been a, a great example from our superintendent and our principal and one of our instructional directors to really demonstrate the, the value of those words and the fact that they do exist within our building and our students understand them and are exposed to them. And we're all learning and we're all growing, but the, the message, I think there's a tremendous awareness inside the building. And so maybe the awareness isn't equaled outside of the building, and that's why when we as a board or an administration have used that with some of the adults in our community, they, ha they maybe haven't fully been able to um, understand the broadness of that um, explanation, if you will. I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but I just feel like tonight has has really made it so apparent on what a, an integral part One Lake Forest High School is in who we are as an educational institution. And so I'm just grateful for, for you being here and for, for the words of Dr. Lennart and Dr. Montgomery tonight too, so. That's my little segue. <laughs> Now we will move on to public participation. This is the point in the evening when we invite members of the community that would like to address the board. We do ask that at this time um, public comment be um, related to items on this evening's agenda. If you have a topic that is other than um, those on tonight's agenda, there will be an opportunity later in the meeting for you to address the board. So anyone that would like to address the board on tonight's meeting agenda topics, I invite you to come to the podium and identify yourself and share your input. <coughs> Terrific, hi, my name is uh, Stephen, and uh, it is, my topic is loosely affiliated with the topics uh, covered tonight. Uh, and such a great meeting, so positive that uh, I'm a little bit of the downer. I'm a parent uh, of uh, a couple of three students that have gone to Lake Forest High School, one's at Northwestern, one's at Santa Clara University, and one is currently a junior. And um, you know, like Dr. Montgomery said, there are peaks and there are troughs. It's great that we're out of the pandemic. I'm the trough guy because I'm a parent. Parents are probably typically here when there are issues. Um, Dr. Leonard uh, mentioned in one of her statements that students uh, should all get a fair shake at a promising future. And that is my loosely affiliated comments for tonight. Uh, so I would like to share something with you if you feel that I need to wait till later in the night to cover it, just hit the gong and I'll go and I'll wait. Um, so uh, I, I'm on a number of boards, uh, both locally and nationally, so it's great to be here. I appreciate all you guys do. It's odd to be here on this side of the podium. Um, my wife, who's also here, we're really low maintenance. We've had three kids go through. We haven't really had any issues to stand up in front of you or even to meet with teachers uh, in the past. Uh, my daughter uh, has been out of uh, math for the past two and a half weeks. It's been pretty rough. But I wanted to kind of anchor that in maybe a larger, more systematic uh, issue related to all kids being treated equally and having a fair shake. Um, my understanding uh, from, from Dr. Uh, Sasson is that pre-calc, so my daughter's a junior, she's in pre-calc accelerated, and she wants to move down to pre-calc. There have been, at the beginning of the year, there were 36 students in pre-calc in two classes. Uh, now there are 50 students in pre-calc I don't know if they all moved from pre-calc accelerated, but I get the sense that a lot of them have. And then there's another five or six kids in the queue waiting. So from my perspective, you know, you look at, at you know, the, the additional 14 kids plus the five or six in the queue, that's almost 20 students uh, that are, are moving from somewhere else into regular pre-calc. That's about 55%. And if you look at that number going from 36 to 55, you can look and say, okay, 35% of the students that want to be in pre-calc started somewhere else. So the question is, why is there this systematic issue of, of so, many, so many students who, you know, took geometry last year that were prepared, 
uh, now somehow they're not getting the content. There, there seems to me like there must be some sort of a breakdown in the process of evaluation of placement. I, and possibly it has to do with um, you know, the curriculum that's currently in place and having a safety net for some of the kids that are, are suffering. But to me, that's a compelling number, right? To go from 36, now we're at, at 50, and there's another five or six at the queue. So why am I here? Because of the experience of my daughter. It's been a rough two and a half weeks. She did everything right. She went to the class she was supposed to do. She worked hard. She's a B in the class, but she just doesn't get it. Just doesn't get it. She went to Dr. Panfield, great guy. He's been an advocate. Uh, said, great, we'll move you down. I've got a spot for you, um, but you're gonna have to talk to your teacher first. Uh, went to parent-teacher conferences. They went smoothly, really well, by the way. Loved them. Um, and uh, the teacher basically, one, one-sided conversation, like tough love, like, hey, you gotta come to me when you have a problem and just wasn't catching the nuance of, of, of our child who really was struggling. Uh, so a few days later, uh, we regroup, talks with mom and dad, and uh, things, now everything is full. There's no way for her to move. So now my child's options are, you can either stay in a class that's way over your head, which is causing issues, you know, to say the least, or you can go to something called Apex, which is you learn on a, vid on a video, um, you know, and it's not just that that's the short-term solution and that there's five or six other kids that are experiencing this, but it's that this may be for all year if other kids don't step, step down. Um, and I, I, that, that, that is really difficult. It's been difficult on our family, but I think there's some unintended consequences here. I think you know, when, you, when you start out with 36 and then it fills up to 50, and, and you know, maybe you know, those classes are full and the, student un the, the, parent, the teacher union says, hey, Without the teacher's permission, you can't go over that amount. Now it's who was first to, to, to drop. And my daughter did it within the timing. It was by October 20th. She talked to Dr. Panfield. She did everything right. But because she was the 15th student to come, there's, n there's no place for her to go. Um, and that doesn't seem fair. Today, there's another five or six students besides her. In the future, there may be another 10. And I think the unintended consequence is, OK, student, my daughter, Next time you're not doing great in your class, I want you to immediately, I don't want you to try, I want you to immediately drop because there may not be a place for you next time. And that is a slippery slope for us to tell all of our, our students and it's going to slide everybody down to a lower common denominator and it's not good for our school. Uh, so what I'm here asking for um, is for every student to have a, a fair shake and a promising future, for my daughter to have a place to go and learn from a teacher in a, a program that fits her for the five other students that are in the, that situation, for the 15 that were able, were able to make that transfer. It shouldn't just be based on time, that's not fair. And if it, it's related to budgets, we all have budgets, right? There are times where I might, you know, I have a car and I've gotta put it on my credit card because I can't afford to pay it. But then I'll go balance my budget later on. And, uh, you know, Dr. Leonard, I've heard terrific things about you. I'm sure you're terrific. But as I've gone through the right channels of, of first, um, Dan Panfield's terrific, and then John, John Maher, terrific, looking for solutions. But I could tell on their faces that they had the shackles on. There's nothing I could do. So when I was able to communicate with Dr. Leonard, you know, her comment was, you know, hey, the reality is we don't have an infinite budget. You know, I would say, well, you've got 20 kids that, that want to move to a different class. You've got 20 kids that aren't in class anymore. Balance the budget. Find a way to do it. Borrow from here. Figure out a solution. Um, but what really is troublesome is it's not just, I understand a short-term solution. We didn't forecast right. But really challenging to know that it may be an entire year where my student is sitting in front of a video camera or just not taking math at all. And I would think that there would be the possibility of having some interim December, January, you know, adjustment to where we can get kids in class. And, you know, I understand Dr. Leonard, and again, I appreciate it, but, uh, you know, I think, you know, when I said, hey, I may come tonight, you're like, hey, great, come and ask this board, and I'm, I'm saying this in a more cynical way, because it, it just, just is. Ask for more money, ask, like the budget. You're preaching to the choir, right? But I, I, that's not creative, that, that's not it. I think there's a solution here that doesn't require to go and ask you guys for more money. Um, so, so what I'm asking for is, you know, let's first solve what's immediate in front of us. There are five or six students that really don't have a, a safe place for math right now, or they're in a special situation where if you're a kid that's sensitive, you're isolated and looked at as, as that, that odd kid who's sitting in a room staring at a TV for math, that's not cool for everybody. You've reached your three-minute limit. 
Terrific. Well, I appreciate uh, you all listening and uh, look forward to hearing back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's Hollis Bloom. I actually hadn't planned on speaking, but I like to come to the meetings to learn new things, and so then I got questions today. So here we go. There are two easy ones, I think. Um, in regards to the um, ESL, how many non-English speaking students versus English speaking students are there? Do we know? I mean, I, you probably don't know the answer tonight. It's fine. But I'm just curious because I was trying to pay attention. <laughs> um, and then, and also I'm just curious of what percentage, so if 100% of the, uh, the ESL kids graduate, what is the percentage of not, of English speaking children? I don't have the right vernacular, but English speaking kids graduate. So just curious for those statistics. And I was an English major, right? <laughs> um, and then I am not, I'm not saying that I'm a typical person out in the community. And um, I, I, I often don't, okay, I, this is not a negative comment in the least. This is just a, a average Joe who shops at Trader Joe's comment. Um, I don't even know what um, one Lake Forest is. I, and, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't often, uh, I mean, sometimes I don't pay attention, that's true. But anyway, just as a little bit of a litmus test, I don't know if it's because I wasn't reading the newsletters. It's probably my fault. But just so you guys know, I really don't know what it is. Um, and that's just to help you. That's how you uh, Hollis, just a couple things that I was looking up. Uh, two percent of our population is English language learners. Okay. And the overall graduation rate is ninety-eight percent. But that's not split out. So it was a hundred percent of the ESLs graduate. And ninety-eight percent of the of whole, the whole po population. Okay. 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 Thank you. It's not broken out on the report card. What Dr. Abel said. So all I can see is what's on the report card, which is the total, and then also. Oh, that's uh, fine. Yeah. That's fine. Thanks. And then One Lake Forest is a statement that you can read. It's on the school's website. On what I'd, website? Pardon me? On the school's website? It is. Okay. Um, and it's we voted on it last April at our board meeting, and I did read it then, not that you listen I to sure. every board meeting, but um, it, it is on the website, and if you don't find it, shoot me an email, and I will forward it to you. I, you know what? The only reason I brought it up is because if – I mean, look how many other parents come to the board meeting, right? Very few. And so, um, and, and I try to be involved and a participant. So it's just, it's just a, it's a thought. If I, don't, if I don't know what it is, then what do we need to do to get that out to more people? Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to just yeah, no, go take a little one-person poll. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with the Portrait of a Learner? Yes, okay. that one I know. I so is that, is that enveloped within? Well, they, I would say they hold hands. They, they both are okay. um, basically uh, foundations of who we are as a school district. Okay. Is that I how you would I answer think that? I think if I may add, so the, the, the one Lake Forest is as Aaron pointed out, has been in the works for a while, and it's really aimed at un being explicit about how we feel about differences and the acceptance of those differences and the experiences with which come along with it. Okay. And, and, but I do think, you know, you're making a good point, which is, you know, I mean, you communicating with the community on a pretty regular basis, maybe it's helpful to mm -hmm. just, you know, restate it, put a link, and put it in there, and and say here it is, and here's what we're doing about it. So yeah, and I don't think it's, uh, you know, I'm I'm not actually uh, making a statement about your communication in the least. I'm just, you know, there's so much going on. I'm I barely get through the day, reading all the emails, deleting stuff from everybody. So it, you know, I just missed it, or I don't I don't know. But I just wanted you to know that that it wasn't as familiar of a term to me. Portrait of a learner, for sure, I'm, uh, I'm aware of that one. Okay? All right, and thanks for all you guys do. Thank you.
Hello. Um, I know some of you, but for those that I don't know, my name is Dana Anderson. I am a parent of kids in District 67. I'm a very actively involved parent in our community. I was a member of the um, Portrait of a Learner Committee for our district. I'm now on the strategic planning for D67 team. I'm a room mom. I'm an SEL coordinator. I'm there. I show up. Um, and, you know, on top of all that we all have going on. So I'm actively following what's going on in our schools and in touch with, with leadership. So I want to follow up in regard to the One Lake Forest Community High School statement. I also sat in on the Ed Committee meeting in the spring of 21 when that was um, recently passed and, and, and discussed. Um, so I'm following up uh, on previous communication with leadership that I've had um, about the recent events of threats of school violence and anti-Semitic hate symbols um, that occurred at the high school. So while there was a lot of communication on the investigation and the security in our schools after that event or during that event, there was no communication denouncing hate during the, uh, the, the, those events. Students felt vulnerable and they felt scared. Some of them didn't go to school and some of them told me that they felt like walking targets in the halls of the high school because of their religion. There was no initial messaging at that time on trauma or the fear that that event incited and how that affected students. There was no messaging that hate speech and discrimination is not tolerated in our schools. It cannot be assumed that students will receive messages at home that hate is not tolerated. I expect that school leaders and school board leaders embrace that message and share it loudly and broadly. The One Lake Forest inclusivity statement was passed in March of 2021. It should be proudly shared with all. It's only recently available on the website, several, several ticks down under the About Us menu. It, it previously was buried and very difficult to find. It should re be reviewed with all students and families often and especially when incidents of discrimination occur. The statement should be included in um, the statements that are reinforcing the values of our school and our community. There's often statements reinforcing who we are and what we stand for. That statement should be reiterated and again, broadly on display whenever those value statements are made. As said tonight, the statement says, we understand that excellent and exemplary school districts foster a culture of inclusion where the lives and needs of all students are validated, recognized, and appreciated. It also says, I'll repeat it, in order to maximize the possibility for each student's growth, we continue to actively work to eliminate barriers, systems, and practices that maintain or contribute to disparities, inequities, discrimination, and intolerance of any kind. Please, I ask to provide yourselves and your staff with the prof professional development that seems to be needed to better actualize this statement and to better directly denounce hate immediately when it occurs, hate, to denounce hate and bias when it occurs. Incidents of hate will unfortunately, con they'll continue to occur. When there's perceived silence by the adults in the community, that's interpreted by students and by families and by people like me that it's okay, carry on. I expect you all as school leaders to uphold the One Lake Forest community statement and to better respond to hate and discriminatory acts. Please issue public statements on hate um, and bias directly. Denounce hateful acts. Teach our students to do better. There are so many missed learning opportunities here where students can learn from, from a horrible incident. They, they can learn from that. Um, I also ask that you support marginalized stu students um, missing from communication on the events surrounding the Lake Forest Homecoming human rights um, sign that was taken down, missing from that communication was messaging to the entire student body that underrepresented and marginalized groups 
are often targeted as they were, and they're often silenced as they were in that homecoming event. So please support your marginalized students and teach all your students, teach all your students that hate and bias and discrimination is not tolerated. Thank so you, you've I've, reached your three minutes. This is the, the job of the adult learners. I appreciate that you all want to include the students' perspectives too, but you're the adult leaders. You have to role model this for us. And, it ha and, and you have to role model it for the students. And again, please use that statement. Please broadly broadcast it and include it in your statements on the values. The community does not, does not know about it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board? Okay, then we are going to move on to our committee re reports and I'm going to start with Dewey Weinbrenner and the Education Committee. I appreciate the comments that uh, we've heard tonight. I, I think we have work to do um, to, to make the One Lake Forest a, a high school statement m more more readily available to our community. Um, I, I know the work that we've done. I know the work that's been done in the school. And, and so we hear you loud and clearly. We spoke about it this morning. Uh, Dr. Abel spoke really thoughtfully about some of the work that's being done to embed <clears throat> that statement into um, curriculum and into professional development. But um, when there are events that occur in the schools where there's a need to speak clearly, I'm sorry if we've um, let folks down because that's not our intent. Um, so we had a meeting this morning. That was one of the issues that we discussed. We discussed the facilities master plan. Um, and um, we discussed also the, the process audit that Dr. Sasson's done for around our opt-out procedures. And, I, and I, I think there's a lot of great work to, going on in our schools. I always enjoy the spotlights. Um, they're, they're worth listening to. There, there are so many thoughtful educators in the building, and, and there is a lot of work happening there. And, and I'm, I'm sorry when we don't highlight it as well as we can. Um, uh, so that's my report on the Education Committee. Thank you, Dewey. Okay, John Noble, Finance and Operations Committee. Yep, so uh, we have not met uh, since last board meeting. We're gonna, looks like we will have a meeting coming up in December. We're trying to firm updates for that for uh, some continuing discussion and um, I think everything seems to be under control, hopefully. Um, so yeah, we're working on things but not a lot to update, so we're all good. Okay, Sally Davis, Policy Committee. The Policy Committee met last week, October 24th, and it was an ad hoc meeting to discuss a particular policy that is on the agenda um, for our discussion tonight as a first reading. We put together um, at the recommendation of Dr. Lennart and with input from Dr. McHugh and also then um, through looking at policies that were already published, first from Dr. Lenart's um, old district in Fairfax County, but then also others around the country, relating to recognition of um, student political activities and their ability and their right to express themselves and also to participate in peaceful um, expressions of their political beliefs. So we um, have drafted a policy which is not part of the regular press readings. This will be the first reading of it tonight. We will then take comments from the community and from any of the board members and we will then read it for a second time at the December meeting with an eye toward um, adopting it. It is primarily about the ability of our students to peaceably assemble and to express their political views. Um, it also addresses the concerns we have about where they do that, whether it's on school grounds or off. Um, I, it makes reference also to student behavior in relation to it, both in terms of um, their um, attendance policy and other policy co codes of conduct that they need to follow. 
Um, and there's reference, which I do think is relevant to the conversations we've had this evening, including from the community, um, around reports of discrimination, harassment, or bullying involving participating students or non-participating students that are addressed according to board policy. So I do think it's relevant to how we are uh, looking to embody the One Lake Forest message as well as the portrait of a learner in bespoke policies for our community. Thank you, Sally. Now we'll move on to liaison reports, and I'll start with John Noble and Ed Red, please. Yep, so not a ton of uh, legislative news, uh, just a couple things that are happening. Um, the Ed Red ad hoc committees had started up, so uh, I joined uh, two of them this year. Uh, one is on safety, one is on special ed funding. So I was able to attend both of those last Friday. Um, bless you. Um, they were really good and we were able to actually, I think there was about 15 or 16 people in both or 15 or 16 districts um, in both of those. And so it was a good kind of set of introductions and grounding and the goals of those is really to come up with some legislation, legislation and actually philosophy of, of how to attack those two problems. So uh, from the safety funding perspective, um, that was talking really about safety best practices. Um, and kind of a holistic approach. It follows on uh, a little bit one of the resolutions that we passed, and so that was cited a little bit with Ed Red, but it would be to do some additional things and really start to highlight um, statewide some best practices and links to that. The special ed funding um, was good, um, and it's something that Ed Red has been trying to get going, and so that's been a, a really good start. And what that gets into is really the classification understanding of the, the funds that are being used across different special ed categorizations and the deficit that across the schools. So we're somewhere into the $3 million of deficit funding that we have to fund as a district just to comply with federal and state mandates on special ed funding and we don't get the dollars because of our uh, district and where we are in the wealth uh, the, the, uh, the, the amount of dollars that we see in our community versus a rural district or where we are from a tier funding perspective. And so one of our goals is not necessarily to take uh, a finite amount of funds away from other districts, but to understand what we can expect and what we can lobby to the federal government around the mandates for us, the categorization of the kids, the flexibility we might have, and then understand that what we share with our community, what that deficit, what they're also funding in those tax dollars that they're doing. And this doesn't apply just to us, it applies to 67, it applies to many districts. And the interesting part from Ed Red perspective is that we're mainly in the North Shore Cook districts, about 85 of them, and these are more well-off districts. And so it's really trying to get a better definition around special ed and the funding. Um, so th th hopefully this is a good start and we'll get some leverage into it, um, but, but it, it, both of these are fairly dense topics, so we'll, we'll see where they go, um, and we're hopeful to get some beginning on those. Um, and the last thing I did want to mention was uh, some work that Bridget Peach has done at Ed Red, her, the executive director. Uh, the mandates and the stuff we've been working on that kind of fell off last year, she's been able to gain a, a lot of uh, traction with Rep Representative Musman, who is the congressional lead for K through 12 in the House. And so she is taking on um, kind of a narrow area around uh, training for teachers and they've got support from a couple different lobbying groups, which is really good, teachers unions as well on that, to kind of hopefully simplify and, and get rid of some of the professional development hours that are being eaten up by the mandated trainings. So it's, it's a, a little bit of a Christmas tree. Hopefully we can get the beginnings and then start to hang some other things on this, but this looks actually like it will arrive in the next legislative session. So sometime in January, we should see some real bills where it kind of fell off for a various set of reasons. But um, I don't know if it'll be all what we want. It should be at least a, a good beginning. Um, and the last thing is we're voting on the IS, IASB resolutions tonight. So that'll be coming up. And then uh, we'll be voting on that at the conference in November. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Thank you, sorry for the long. No, don't apologize. It's always very informative. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, John Venson, True North Educational Cooperative 804. Uh, thank you. Um, don't um, interpret the shortness of the report from Dr. Schneider as, as an indication that we had a short, easy meeting. Um, actually, uh, the amount of time, effort, and thoughtfulness that has gone into two major 
um, thrusts on the part of the board, and that is the strategic plan and the facilities plan, have chew up a lot, if not almost all of the time, as you can understand since we're involved in similar um, ongoing discussions. Uh, the facilities plan, there are two phases. The first renovation phase is expected to go to the board for approval uh, at the November meeting and is expected to be funded by the fund balance for True North. The second phase, which is larger is a little bit more complex, um, is um, being discussed both from what will be done as well as how it will be funded. And they are looking into funding options. I'm not aware they're looking towards a referendum, but towards other funding options that they may have. Uh, those will follow the um, approval of phase one. The strategic plan is, is ongoing um, with uh, close to 20 individual opinions on the leadership council. I think that Dr. Schneider would trade you for shared services in a second. <laughs> but uh, it, 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 is, it is slow, but I, it is truly thoughtful. And I expect that we will get a draft plan in place by February. So John, with their, their move um, and, and renovation, will they house the same number of students that they were, or will they house more? or less, or do you know? Uh, I think what they're trying to do, one is they're getting out of a rental building that, um, that the owner w wants them to get out by July 1st. So the, fa the, the urgency for phase one is to, uh, to accommodate the students that were um, taken care of there. But the, the long-term goal is to build enough, build enough flexibility to meet increased needs of students and plan for um, immersion back into the community which will then free up additional spaces. So uh, the long term is to, to continue to be able to support the partners um, in True North. Um, I think the projections for students are expected to rise. Okay. Thank you. And David Burns, Parent Support Organizations. Okay, so I've just got a few notes today. Um, at the foundation meeting, um, you know, one thing I'm sure, uh, Dr. Lenart, you're uh, potentially soliciting, but for any teachers that are listening in on the board, they are looking for grant requests. So we don't want to do this great job uh, raising all this money and then we don't get enough requests. So teachers, uh, come up with some great ideas as to uh, how you can improve the learning uh, for you and our kids. Um, they already have a very good donor base, but one thing that they've noticed is that they're getting great donations for, uh, from a set, but they'd like to increase their number of potential donors. So they're, they're putting a campaign together um, to try to raise uh, or to try to get some level of, of engagement from more uh, and their goal is 115 new donors. So if you do support the foundation and think it's a great idea, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, um, just let them know what, um, what they do, which they do a great job. Another thing they're thinking about is how they can potentially let students and parents, especially as they're going through tours, know what they've, um, what they've done. And so whether it be an emblem or some sort of a, a note, and that's still something they're thinking about how they can do, but when they do tours and, and they see a lot of what the foundation has done, but they don't recognize it, you know, that maybe that's a missed opportunity. So something that they're thinking about. Uh, they have landed on their speaker for their spring uh, foundation luncheon, and that is Matt Duar, who is a uh, humanities and, and wellness teacher at Lake Forest. So that's uh, very closely connected, and should have some great insights. Um, and then something that Matt really did the, the work on, usually it's, it's what I would have had to do, have, have had to done, or have to have done, um, was really to provide insights on our referendum and the master facilities plan and the survey results. I think there was a lot of interest in knowing about that. I think it also helped us to understand, Matt and I, um, how much education there still needs to be provided on what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, lots of questions. So I think it was really meaningful uh, for Matt to be able to be there. I, you know, I had a few comments, but really it was Matt. And the reason I say that about the foundation meeting is that I almost had the exact same experience in the boosters meeting. And so I could tell you about all the different committee reports, but really the most meaningful part was really having a conversation about the referendum. They really wanted to know what was going on, why we were doing it, um, when the communications are gonna start coming out. And so uh, it, was, it was good to, to have that conversation with them. Um, from their perspective, um, kind of the biggest highlight is they are planning already for their booster bash, 
and I love the concept of it, is it's going to be called Booster Madness, um, and it's going to be in March, and very much have a March Madness theme. It's going to be at the Lake Forest Club, there's going to be lots of TVs up, lots of little lounge areas where you can have access to watch the games, I think there's going to be, I don't want to say costumes, but dress up type things, um, so it should be a lot of fun, and so they're just getting that planning going. Um, and then for the APT, they've got their meeting on Thursday, uh, so there wasn't a meeting since the last board meeting. Thank you, Dave. Okay, we will now move on to action items. May I have a motion to approve the first reading of policy 7 colon 132, student political activities? So moved. Second. Sally, I know you did a great job of teeing this up already. Is there anything you want to add? No, this would be the opportunity for any um, other members of the board who had questions about this who were not able to attend the meeting to ask them um, or to share comments before we will put it up for the second reading in the December board meeting. Do you want to add anything, Dr. Lennart? I think Sally did okay, a great job. Any questions or comments from the board? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please, Tiana? Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Mr. Byrne? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Dr. Vinson? Aye. Ms. Zinzer? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Motion carries. May I have a motion to adopt the fiscal year 23 tax levy and the establishment of budget hearing date? So moved. Jen, do you want to give your high-level overview of this for us? Very high-level and start with the correction. It's actually the tentative tax levy hearing um, that we'll be doing in December. So yes, this is basically the uh, setting of the tentative levy. <coughs> it will come through the board in December, on December 6th for a final um, <coughs> vote and adoption. It is basically based on two components, basically based on, it's getting late, um, it is based on two components, which is the annual CPI that's applicable to this year, which, as you know, um, was 7%, but it's also capped by the property tax extension limitation law of 5%. So we're looking at a max of 5% on existing property. And the second component, of course, is new construction within, uh, within the district. So when you pull all of those things together, we end our, also our debt schedule. We are projecting an overall tax increase of 4.88%. Um, however, to allow for some variance, because we don't actually have final numbers from the county on our new construction, we have estimates only, we do recommend that the board adopt a 5.02%, which just gives us a little bit of wiggle in case their numbers uh, change, which they do from time to time. Um, remember that even if we vote for something that's greater than 5%, um, if the formula produces something that is less, you are capped at the lesser amount. So um, just important to note going forward. We will do a formal tax levy hearing at the December 6th meeting. It will be very much like the budget meeting in which it will actually precede your regularly scheduled meeting. It will be a brief presentation of a few slides. Great. Thank you very much. Do, any questions or comments from the board? Okay, Tiana, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Davis? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Mr. Byrne? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Dr. Vinson? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the recommendation to reject roofing bids for summer 2023 West Campus? So moved. Second. Jen, do you want to speak to this? Sure. As you guys uh, are all aware, um, roofing has been a top priority for both campuses. We uh, decided that we were going to attempt to tackle West Campus because it was in the most of need of immediate repair. Um, unfortunately, uh, that the bids did come in extremely high, almost double the cost of estimate and budgeted amounts. Um, we do work with a roofing, specifically a roofing consultant and not architects because it is a very specialized field. Um, we contacted some of the bidders, if not all of the bidders, to seek some information about why the bids came in and what areas came in high. Um, Dan, the director of buildings and grounds, as well as our roofing consultant is working now. They are re-engineering that project and we're gonna be um, back on the street out to bid um, and hopefully receive something that's a little bit more in line with our budget. Can you comment on, I mean, that's a staggering difference, right, between the, what you would think is a consultant who knows what he's doing and, and are, are they just in such a position of strength that they can basically ask any price or did we not 
it, it, it's a combination of things, the things we're seeing in the other areas as well, which is acquisition of materials. And there was, and don't ask me because I know very little about roofs, other than there is a certain component to uh, the roofing design that we had that was particularly hard and difficult to acquire, and of course, then therefore uh, more expensive than another option. So um, specifically, that is what they are drilling down on, is how else can we achieve that same thing, but utilizing perhaps different materials or materials in a different way. Um, they've also looked like there's like a, it's a pebbly kind of gravelly type um, surface that's on top of here. They're also looking at whether or not we can um, actually reuse some of that material or reuse more of that material than we had originally projected. Um, other than that, it's just a combination of labor and it's hard to get contractors right now. And being hard to get contractors right now, um, it looked like Dan Mortensen still is confident that the work will be done summer 2023, correct? Yes. Anyone else? Hmm? He said confident. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would say cautiously optimistic. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please, Tiana? Ms. Mr. Noble? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Mr. Weinburner? Aye. Ms. Zinser? Aye. Dr. Vincent? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the SNS Systems America Security Camera contract in an amount not to exceed $585,000. So moved. Second. Jordan, do you want to give the high level overview of this one? Sure. So, um, Lake Forest High School currently has a security camera system that is it's fairly antiquated at this point. So, it was probably put in mostly around the 2006 referendum, would be my estimate, just looking at the system. Um, it was pretty nice for the time. Uh, over time, the cameras have stopped functioning, the quality has degraded, and quite frankly, our needs and expectations for such a system have increased. Um, when the board passed the recent $15 million borrow, part of that was allocated towards safety and security, um, specifically this camera system that is in need of replacement. We secured um, test systems from two vendors, one Vercata, one Ava, um, Vercata is in use in District 67. Ava is um, a new contractor to us. Uh, both systems worked really well, but as I noted in the report, there were certain features that uh, Lane Linder, our Director of Safety and Security, found beneficial um, in the Ava system, which is what we're ultimately recommending. We had a long list of requirements. It's going to cover more areas. It's going to be more secure. It's going to be more easily shared with outside parties. Um, for instance, the police department can have access to it on a cell phone if they need. Um, we're pretty happy with the system. We're really happy with the pricing. And I would say we're ca cautiously optimistic that we can get it installed by the end of January. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Yeah, just one question. Sorry, I'm not, if you don't happen to have it with you, that's fine. I kind of realized late notice. We have the first year, I think, of the subscription. I think it's for the cloud part of it for free. Do you happen to know what the ongoing cost for this is? Yeah, it will be, um, well, hold on, let me look it up. Yeah, if you don't you, have it. You wrote to me $34,000. So. That is correct, $118.59 per camera. What's nice is through the conversations, we have that rate guaranteed for at least five years, which makes budgeting uh, very easy. Yeah, that's where I was going, so th yeah, thank you. Just make sure we have that in the budget, because this looks like a one-time, but. Just talk to associate, and I wholeheartedly support it. Yeah. So Jordan and I had a little bit of an email exchange on on a few of those things. So I, and I, I think it's important to note, and maybe you can explain a little bit more. It's a hundred percent increase of cameras, right? So we're going from one hundred and sixty. Uh, probably just over that. One hundred and twenty-six yeah. to three hundred forty-eight or something. Yes, three hundred forty-three. Mm -hmm. And so I found that a pretty staggering number. And then associated with that is the cost of 118 per camera per year, which is way, way more than the 5,000 we currently paying, right? If there, there's a reason for it, but I, I just think we need to be aware of that there's a pretty significant increase in running costs, not just the one-time investment. And of course, I had to ask the question if we, you know, saving that money somewhere else because it doesn't grow on trees, um, obviously. So, but but you said there's not really any savings anywhere. 
security personnel or, or people who have to handle that because now it's in the cloud instead of the servers in our facility or? So you, will you, where you will see some cost savings, or I'll, I guess I'll say cost avoidance, is in not having uh, this equipment hosted on site. So right now we have four pretty beefy servers we use to run our current system, um, and that is accounting for the relatively low quality of our cameras, the relatively low frame rate of those cameras, um, and we still need four very large servers to run it. If we were to attempt to host this in-house, we would there would be an additional request here for a significant investment in server infrastructure that we would need to run it. So there is some cost avoidance in going with cloud-based solution, um, in addition to, quite honestly, the other features we get from it and the easy scalability and the easy shareability with our partners. The only thing I would add is remember with in terms of um, the increase in cameras, that was directly noted in the Weidlinger report of additional safety measures that we needed to implement within the building. I'll also add for, uh, for all the camera placements that are um, a part of this proposal, it was walkthroughs with me, walkthroughs with our security teams, walkthroughs with our deans, walkthroughs with outside security experts, outside contractors. We walked through the building a number of times before we came to these final plans. And so in light of that, we asking for, you know, a facility master plan where we're gonna renovate or remodel significant parts of the building that all is, I assume, reusable and flexible enough that it can be replaced or repositioned if necessary. Correct. The only investment you might lose is the, at least in relative terms, the relatively lower cost of the wiring of the cameras, the cameras themselves, the infrastructure, um, some of the back end updates we're gonna have to make to power all the cameras will be usable in any configuration for the building. Thank you. Anyone no problem. Else? Okay, Tiana, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Noble? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Dr. Vinson? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Ms. Vinson? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the ISBE School Maintenance Project Grant fiscal year 2023? So moved. Second. Jen, I don't know if you, do you wanna speak to this? Or, okay, thanks. Okay, Jordan probably could hit this one as well, but this is the project, which is why they were ordered a certain way on the agenda, but annually at least for the last few years, uh, the State Board of Education has made grants available for maintenance. It is a matching grant, meaning you have to put in at least 50,000 to uh, receive 50,000 in return. Obviously, the camera project uh, is, is far exceeding that, um, and we thought that was a natural fit for this year's uh, maintenance grant. Questions or comments? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please, Tiana? Dr. Vinson? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Ms. Vinson? Aye. Mr. Weinbrenner? Aye. Mr. Burns? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Motion carries. <laughs> okay, we're now moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, we do have two consent agenda items that we are going to remove from the consent agenda and address after addressing the consent agenda items that I will list. So may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items including Approval of disbursements, payrolls, and financial statements, June 2022. Approval of human resources report. Approval of ISB recommendation to adopt resolution on fund balances, Miller ratio adjustment at ISB delegate assembly. Approval of an ISB recommendation to adopt resolution on capital grant fund for school buildings at ISB delegate assembly. Approval of ISB recommendation to adopt resolution on school safety fund at ISB de delegate assembly. Approval of an IISB recommendation to reject resolution on involvement with candidates for public office at ISB de delegate assembly. Approval of ISB recommendation to adopt resolution on mandates review committee at IISB delegate assembly. Approval of ISB recommendation to adopt resolution on financial contribution for school board elections at IISB delegate assembly. So moved. Okay, um, does anybody have any questions or comments that they want to make on any of the consent agenda items? We did discuss them in workshop. I do. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm all about business right now. Yes, Sally, you do, please. I would like to make a comment regarding item number nine, or now it's seven, on the um, consent agenda. Uh, approval of IASB recommendation to adopt resolution on mandates review. Um, I need to stop and give a shout out to our own board member, John Noble, who has worked tirelessly to bring together not only a group at EdRed, but also bring to IASB um, improvements to the existing um, ISB policy or um, legislative priority and um, with respect to unfunded mandates. There are two important additions that he convinced the resolution committee to uh, recommend adoption of and they are both they both add teeth to what has been the resolution before. The first is to form a committee that will actually action and look at unfunded mandates and the second is to uh, push for mandatory sunset provisions in mandates. Those are actionable ways in which we can advance the agenda that the item that has not been addressed till this point. So this is really hard work to push this rock up this hill and you've been um, tireless and you have been persuasive and we are super proud that this is District 115 on the board and actually pushing for something that matters to us. So kudos and thank you. And for anyone watching or listening, the delegate assembly occurs once a year and it is a gathering of school board representatives from across the state. And if this resolution is adopted, which has been recommended by the resolution committee, this will impact districts across the state, not just our district. So in a so meaningful financial way, which is phenomenal. just to be, these are resolutions. There still needs to be legislation and that still needs to be passed. So these Which I'm assuming things. you're gonna work on next. We, we, we will try. And okay. just like the school safety fund, um, also getting kind of a, a blueprint for um, the federal government to actually cover costs that Jordan outlined as well as operating costs. Because as Mark has talked about, it's not just a one-time purchase, it's actually an ongoing type of thing and putting towards resources and people and those things, it's all nice to get a donation for an object or a thing, but to, to pay for the operating costs year by year. And so that's part of the school safety fund is to also get some type of dollars that understand funding something for five or 10 years because you have to make an investment and then have that time. So there's a lot of stuff to do, but I think these are good blueprints to hopefully get some legislative behind. So I pre thank you for the kind words. And just to explain, the school uh, safety fund uh, resolution was also the work of John Noble and he did partner with District 67 on this. Um, the mandates uh, review resolution authored by John Noble involves District 67 as well as District 65. So thank you for working with our surrounding communities. Okay, anyone else before we go to a vote? Tiana, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Sinzer? Aye. Mr. Byrne? Aye. Ms. Davis? Aye. Dr. Vinson? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Aye. Mr. Noble? Aye. Mr. Weinberner? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Now the two items pulled from the consent agenda we will uh, discuss and vote on individually. Uh, may I have a motion for the approval of IASB recommendation to reject resolution on alternative fueled school bus funding at IASB Delegate Assembly? So moved. May I have a second? Second. Okay, I know Marcus, you wanted to, this pulled from the consent agenda, you had some comments to make. Does anyone else have questions or comments? Okay, Tiana, may I have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Byrne? Aye. Mr. Weinburner? Aye. Dr. Schaubacher? Me. Dr. Vinson? 
Aye. Ms. Ba Ms. Davis? Nay. Mr. Noble? Aye. Ms. Denzel? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve for approval of ISB recommendation to reject resolution on firearm dealer location at ISB delegate assembly? So moved. Second. Thank you. Um, and discussion on this resolution. The argument is similar. So th this one isn't particularly addressed to the presence of um, weapon dealers and the associated advertising or displaying of weaponry close to schools. The current regulation, I think, is 500 feet, and the proposal is to extend that to 1,500 feet. I understand that that might in selected or isolated communities have an impact, in, and I think the argument was made in, in rural areas. I still think the importance, given the current environment, of um, not having children exposed to visualization of weapons in school, um, given the recent school sh inc dramatic increase in school shootings, uh, I find that argument superficial at best. So I would plead that we reject the proposal of the association. Well, and I, <coughs> I'd like to comment on that. I don't know what how this would be actually enforced, but previously being on a zoning committee, um, this could be grandfathered in for some of those that have hardship, and, and it's not, I don't want to say feasible, but that they can't just, they don't have to pick up and move and go somewhere else, but it, if put into place, it could provide guidance and um, you know rules around where new establishments can be made. So I would think it might be if they are just creative about it, they can be flexible with exi existing locations um, if they need to be grandfathered in, but yet have this in place for future establishments. So I, um, in reading this resolution and deciding how I would vote um, whether to support the resolution committee or not, I looked at what the committee concerns were and my takeaway is that increasing the uh, radius by 1,000 feet fell short in their opinion of actually serving the intent of the resolution, which is the trauma created by, see created by seeing gun advertisements. And, and I believe that we will see a rewriting of this resolution as we have before. Um, I've attended the delegate assembly on behalf of District 115 in the past, and I know some of the resolutions, it's really the, um, the intent and the, and the way the resolution is writ written by the district that submits it isn't um, always in the eyes of the resolution committee adequate at fulfilling the intent. And so it is, my thought and, and belief that we will see this again, but with better and, and more enforceable parameters. Thank you, Jenny, and I wanna clarify. So I, I think the resolution should pass, so I'm not, and I, but the, <laughs> it's a little, it's a double. Right, double no, goal, right? So it is, the, yes. We asking for approval of the Right. committee's recommendation and I'm saying we should reject the recommendation and the resolution should go through as written and the argument is that I think it's better than nothing and I hear you when you're saying you know maybe it gets rewritten it that that can be added later on I, through an amendment to the resolution but I think just saying no we should not have a resolution about um, moving weapon imagery in any which way or form further from the schools is wrong. So I think we, as a first step, it's sufficient. I get the argument, but I, I think it's better than nothing. And if it, if we, if the dis other districts feel it needs to be enhanced, then we can do that later. But I, I think it's wrong not to do <laughs> anything. So just to be clear. So I'm advocating for rejecting the recommendation of the committee. Right, I, okay, I understand. Anyone else? Okay, Tiana, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Vincent? Nay. Mr. Noble? Aye. 
Mr. Davis? Nay. Mr. Burns? Nay. Dr. Schaubacher? Nay. Ms. Vinzer? Aye. The motion does not carry. Uh, Tiana, I did not vote, and I, I, I would like to vote. I'm no. sorry. Yeah, I'd I'm like so to vote sorry. No <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Weiburner? No. <laughs> the motion does not carry. Okay, thank you. Okay, FOIA requests. Dan O'Neill, in progress, two of two. Jonah Meadows, the patch, in progress. Walter Brzezewski, in progress. All right, we are at the point in the meeting where we are um, going to hear public comment from anyone who is uh, interested in addressing the board for a topic not on tonight's agenda and a topic other than what's been addressed already. No, that's not necessary. So no, we we heard you, and we and and I respect. You want to add something? If you. You well, it's, if it's on the same topic, then no. But if you want to add something you didn't already get to say to us, then I I will let you do that. <laughs> I just wanted to add one thing that I left out is that it would be really awesome for the One Lake Forest Community High School statement to be inclusive of both di districts so that this work isn't, um, we're not spinning the wheels and turning them again in D67. And I've had those conversations with folks in D67. So it would be awesome if this right, like inclusive statement was inclusive of our whole district. Thank you. Okay, sure, thank you. Okay, anyone else? So seeing none, I will move on to announcements. Tuesday, November 8th, 2022 is election day, so there is no school for students and staff. Monday, November 14th is the Facilities Community Forum at 6 p.m. at the East Campus in the RMA with tours at 7 p.m. Wednesday, November 23rd, 2020 is Thanksgiving break, no school for students and staff. Oh, I'm sorry, and that's Wednesday, November 23rd through Friday, November 25th. Tuesday, December 6, 2020 is our next Board of Education meeting at 7 p.m. here at the West Campus Boardroom. May I have a motion to adjourn the Lake Forest Community High School District 115 board meeting for November 1, 2020? So moved. Second. Second. May I have a voice vote, please? All in favor say aye. 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 